Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Gardenside Christian Church. I'm so glad you're here, whether you're in person or online. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, we have an exciting day to share with you more about the path and, and what that looks like. So uh, rather than a lot of platitudes and things, I would just like to just pray and get this worship started this morning. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for our time together. We love you, Lord, and we just thank you so much for your gift uh, that you've given us uh, through your Son that we can have eternal life through you. And we celebrate that. We're about to worship you. And Lord, just help us to worship you with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, everything we got, we give it to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? Sing with me. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's 
Thank you for your promises. They are new every day. And thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross for our sins. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You can be Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for bringing us to the throne. Clay and Will and Greg, amazing job this morning. Uh, my name is Keith Merritt, and I am the family minister here at Gardenside Christian Church. And I'm so excited to be able to share a message with you this morning, uh, continuing on our series, The Path. And this morning, uh, what I'm going to share with you is that your heart matters. Your heart matters. Now, when you hear the phrase, stubborn as a mule, right? That's usually what most people would say. That is something that you probably grow, uh, when you were growing up, you heard. Now, uh, a, a mule is something that probably is the picture is popping up in your mind. Uh, something like this, really obstinate, really, uh, really just stubborn, won't really go where you want it to go, really, really just, man, uh, really frustrating to deal with, right? Uh, they're, uh, they have a, a reputation of digging their hooves into the dirt and refusing to budge. Or maybe you're picturing a donkey and you really uh, just have this idea that there's just stubbornness just unwilling to cooperate just kind of flows through your mind when you think of those things now uh, donkeys and mules both have reputations as animals with you know mulish personalities uh, they're widely seen as stubborn willful and obstinate but can I tell you that there's been some studies done people actually studied this <laughs> I was surprised when I was preparing and learning this myself but they actually aren't. Uh, there's a study done by Canterbury Christ Church University and Devon's The Donkey Sanctuary that showed that when it came to showing flexibility towards solving a problem like learning how to learn, uh, mules came out on top, followed by donkeys with horses, and dogs are one of the, the last categories. So why is there a common misperception about this? Uh, mules and donkeys, they're smart. They're really smart. They also have a deep-seated tendency to self-preserve. They're very selfish. And so they won't let owners overwork them, nor will they typically put themselves in danger. They're very aware of their self, and, and that is what they're solely focused on. These characteristics, though, on the outside, if you look at it, that would lead to that label, stubborn, stubborn. Uh, when I hear the beginning of that phrase, stubborn as a, I don't think of mule, I think of stubborn as a merit, a merit. In fact, less merit to be exact, and that's my dad. And so, uh, in fact, as I was preparing to share this message with you, uh, I called my parents and, and I said, Dad... I'm going to be preaching and sharing a message, uh, and I am looking for an illustration about being stubborn, so I figured I would go straight to the source, and I would call you, because you are where I got all my stubbornness from. And then he says, well, son, you done come to the right place. I said, I knew it. I knew it, Pops. You're always there for me, Dad. And so uh, he told me, uh, there's a picture of uh, uh, my dad and I at the Grand Canyon, great time, awesome time, uh, where mules and donkeys are usually uh, in, giving tours and things like that. But uh, my dad shared the story, and he said, I was in second grade, and I got in trouble for talking in elementary school. And he's like, I promise you I didn't do it. I said, okay, Dad, we all didn't do it. Okay. Uh, but he got in trouble for talking, so the teacher said that he had to stay at his desk and be quiet, and he couldn't move. Okay? And then at this time, the rest of the class went to the cafeteria for lunch. He had to stay there because he was in trouble, and so uh, he stayed there. Now, the class came back, and the teacher brought him a tray of lunch. Guess what my dad did? 
nothing. He stood still, didn't say anything. He didn't eat anything. And he was so stubborn, he went home hungry. And so uh, if you're ever wondering about uh, a DNA trait that's passed down in my family, that's, that's where I got it from. And so uh, he was stubborn and he shared that story with me. And uh, I actually have a picture of my dad in his class when this actually was around the time that it happened. That's my dad in the middle. That's Big Les. Uh, that's my dad. And then that's the whole class. So he had to sit at one of those desks uh, for quite a while. And he just he said, I ain't eating this. Nope. I'm just going to sit here and be still. When he could have just very easily just said, okay, I'm hungry. I can eat this and then go about your day. Nope, not my dad. Nope. Nope, not at all. But if I were him, I probably would do the same thing. So there is the uh, inherent flaw in the DNA. Uh, and my wife, Jonica, will attest to this, that that trait has been passed down and that I am very stubborn as well. And so she's blessed because uh, we've actually just celebrated our seven-year wedding anniversary and she's put up with me for seven years despite all that crazy stubbornness so yeah that's awesome you can clap for that let's celebrate awesome marriages seven years booyah that's right I think it's pretty awesome love my wife she's beautiful and amazing anyway uh, <laughs> but if you you've ever seen a mule uh, you can see how easily that the idea of them being stubborn can be misconstrued. Mules really aren't one of the most stubborn creatures on earth, though. That would belong to us as human beings. We're the most stubborn creatures, right? Uh, given a mule's demeanor, uh, they would almost never choose the right path because mules don't like to think about future consequences. They just want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, regardless of the eventual outcome. And so in that way, they're not unlike many of us. We are misconstrued, misunderstood at times. We are two-legged mules, and we are just a little more subtle about our self-preservation and our rebellion to God's path. And so here's what we do. Sometimes we come to a fork in the road, fork in the road. Hopefully you grabbed some of these last week because it was an amazing sermon last week. But you come to a fork in the road and you weigh your options. Then we choose the road that feels the best to us at the moment. That path may not be the best path for us. So as soon as we figure out what we want to do, we put our minds to work figuring out reasons to justify our decision. Like, you might have these conversations. Well, we traded in our old car because it was a gas guzzler. And so, well, we really couldn't afford it, but we laid 20000 down after the trade-in. And if we drove our new, more efficient model 35 years, the difference in gas consumption... Well, I don't know if it really would add up to that $20,000 we put down on the trade-in. Or the battery on our cell phone doesn't last a full day anymore. So we decide to pick up an iPhone, a brand new one, which you know if you go to purchase an iPhone, that's like buying a car or leasing a vehicle now. But we'll pay that payment instead of just replacing the battery, which would probably be about 60 bucks or so. It just made sense. What kind of sense? Like dollars and cents? Or common sense, because I get kind of confused. And more and more these days, I hear from people who ask, how did I end up on this path? How did I end up on this road? Why, why did God let me get into this situation in the first place? Well, author Andy Stanley says this, that our problem rarely stems from a lack of information or insight. It's something else. Something we don't outgrow. Something that another academic degree won't resolve. Our problems stem from the fact that we are not on a truth quest. That is, we don't wake up every morning with a burning desire to know what's true, what's right, or what's honorable. We are on a happiness quest. 
We want to be, as in feel, happy. And our quest for happiness often trumps our appreciation for and pursuit of what's true, what's right, what's good. Now, why do we find ourselves on the wrong path? That's the question I want to pose to you this morning. I feel that there are two reasons. One is this. Our heart is on a happiness quest and not a truth quest. The second is this. Our heart chooses the happy now rather than the happy later. Almost every time. But isn't, isn't that true, though? Isn't that true? We want to be in the now. We want the ba-bang, the right now. Because it's instant gratification. We get exactly what we want when we want it right now. And so there's no forward thinking of, well, if I just hold off, if I just plan ahead, maybe I do some research and maybe I'm prudent instead of doing things the simple way uh, that maybe I can avoid some of those problems. But we are stubborn creatures, right? Uh, so uh, I understand that maybe you take exception to the car thing or the iPhone thing, but let's just start with, and I know this might be a wide demographic here, coffee drinkers. I am putting myself in this category, okay? Thank you, Mark, for raising your hand. You're the man. Uh, <laughs> but coffee drinkers, right? Okay, so coffee drinkers. So uh, what's this all about? Now, my favorite coffee that I would get at, say, a Starbucks uh, costs about $4 for one cup. That's pretty high for a cup of coffee, right? Is it not? Like, that? that's pretty high. But if I'm going to treat myself, if I'm a splurge, I'm going to get uh, something that I really want and I really enjoy. And so... Uh, my coffee costs about four bucks. Now that, that's pretty wild, uh, it, and it's inexcusable in light of the needs of the world today. That's enough money to sponsor two kids in Compassion International. I mean, if you add it up, that's about eighty dollars a month if I skip weekends of of missing out on that coffee. Uh, so, what's wrong with me? Well. I'm on a happiness quest, and nitro cold brew coffee contributes to my happiness. So uh, there's a dilemma there. You know, as, as smart as we are and as aware as we are that life is connected and that decisions today shape the experiences of tomorrow, we still don't wake up every morning in search of truth and insight and enlightenment, and we get up and we do the things that make us happy. We're all on a happiness quest, and I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Fortunately, there's a great deal of overlap in between our happiness quest and then what God would want for us to do to stay on the path and be on the path. For example, I love to exercise. That is something that is enjoyable to me. I like that. Now, is it fun to me? Yes, it makes me happy, but that's not really the point. Uh, exercise is something that's good for my current health, but it's also good for my future health, too. So when I get into one of my favorite workouts, uh, stretching and strengthening my ligaments and tendons, doing some DDPY, uh, Diamond Dallas Page Yoga, I get really fired up, and I also enjoy it. I actually have some crazy photos, because some of you don't believe me that I do any of this stuff, but I do have some photos here up on the screen that will eventually be here of doing some Diamond Dallas Page Yoga uh, but when you hold back the hands of time by uh, lengthening and strengthening your spine, I mean, that's awesome, right? I love that. See, that's real proof right here. So getting, getting that exercise going, getting it up and going, bang, right? That's fun. I enjoy that. That's good for me. It's part of my happiness quest, but there's other things that make me happy. I'll tell you one thing that makes me happy my wife's specialty deep fried Oreos with powdered sugar on it with melted peanut butter on them. I love those. 
That is happiness in your hand. That is goodness and tastiness. And that is what is good and right and true in a kitchen. Amen? Oh, yes. So I can have a happiness quest as well. But see, if I go on that happiness quest too much on the Oreo path every day, that exercise ain't going to be doing too much for me. In fact, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to be in some big trouble. So uh, we have to be careful about pursuing that happy path every day. These are the forks in the road. And sometimes we have overlapping decisions that make it look like we have multiple forks in the road, all converging at the same time. And we have to make some decisions on the path. We have to make some decisions for our purposes. That makes things really complex, doesn't it? That makes things challenging. And when happiness points in one direction, while wisdom, truth, integrity, and common sense point in another, that's when really prudent people start doing really stupid things. That's, that's what happens. That's when the happiness quest becomes treacherous. That is the underlying reason why we intentionally choose paths that will put us in a place that will not take us ultimately to where we want to go, regardless of our SAT scores or GPA or anything like that. Are y'all getting this? Is this making sense that, that there's a, 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 a happiness quest and there's a truth quest? Sometimes those overlap, but sometimes they're totally different. I would look totally different right now if all I ate is my wife's favorite deep fried Oreo goodness. And that's all I ate <laughs> instead of grilled chicken and sweet potatoes, repeat grilled chicken, sweet potatoes, repeat grilled chicken, sweet potatoes, right? My life would be totally different. And so, uh, I want to just pray before uh, I point you towards a solution from God's Word. Father in heaven, please just speak to us this morning. Uh, speak to us through your Word, Lord, and uh, through your Scripture. Lord, speak to us in ways that you help us. Speak to us in ways that challenge us. Speak to us clearly, for we are listening. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So two weeks ago when we started this series... We said that there is an unbreakable principle in the universe that if you try to break it, it will, it will break you. It will break you, and that's your direction determines your destination. Rick shared that with us. And so this principle trumps just about every other natural principle in the universe. And so last week we also talked about the prudent people switching paths when they see trouble coming. They make course corrections, even though that requires more energy, more determination, and almost anything else on earth when you've really got to steer that ship and really make that course on the right track. So the prudent see danger and take refuge, while the simple keep going, and whew, they pay that penalty. They pay that price. Uh, I heard someone wise say, if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. I think that is uh, extremely true, extremely true. And so Solomon diagnosed this problem 3,000 years ago, right along with the problem that we're looking at today. Apparently, people really weren't too different from people today back then. So we're going to take a look in the book of Proverbs in chapter 3. There Solomon gave a solution to the happiness quest in what may be the most famous section of the book of Proverbs. Some of you who have been in church a long time may have this portion of Scripture memorized, burned into your brain. Or uh, you may have never seen this before, and I'd love to share with you for the first time what this looks like in relationship to the path. Let's check this out. It says uh, in verse uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 
Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And as a father, the son he delights in. So, uh, according to Solomon, God will make your path straight if you do three things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and acknowledge Him in all your ways. Now, some of you may not have heard this before. So, I would love to walk you through this, and some of you are almost so familiar with it that it becomes white noise in the background, so I want to help you see it as if you're seeing it for the first time. The starting place for a straight path is just what it says on all American money. In God we trust. Yes! However, that's kind of ironic because in my experience, money is one of the last things that Americans trust God with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, in every arena of life, in every possible path, in every possible category, trust God. The answer to choosing the right path is to choose God, to trust God, to go where He asks you to go, to do what He asks you to do, and you do it every day. It's a lifestyle. It's not a one-time thing. That's why it's called the path. Hmm, fancy. Place all your confidence, all your faith, all your hope, all your plans, everything you got, you place it in the hands of God. The challenge is to not lean on what your heart says is right, not on what your heart wants to do, not leaning on your understanding of how all these things that we are tempted with on the side roads that will draw us off course from following the will of God is. That's the challenge, is staying focused on the path. We can get tempted with anything. Open your phones. I'm sure you're getting text messages from uh, all kinds of advertisement companies. If you go on Facebook, you got ads popping up left and right. You get phone calls from telemarketers. You, you get bombarded by every type of distraction every single day just with one of these guys. Just with one of these. So, I think... Uh, God pre-planned that, and that's why he says this. He knew that we were going to be distracted. And so he lets us know this. In Jeremiah 17, 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things. Hmm, that's not what I hear in the world today. How many times have you said to someone, oh, just go with your heart. What's your heart telling you? Follow your heart. You know what that sounds like? That doesn't sound like the wisdom of the Bible. That sounds like lines from a Hallmark movie. And it's the same plot in a Hallmark movie every single time, just different setting, different location, different people, but it's the same thing. Oh, follow your, your heart. I'm a writer, and I'm just locked in this snowy cabin, and it's just, you, you know what it is. And I'm not too proud to admit I watch Hallmark because right after the movie comes on, Golden Girls comes on. Okay, I'm not too proud, all right? But, I mean, you know that's what it is, and that's what culture thinks. That's what we're told. Oh, follow your heart. Some Disney magical stuff. Did they, they miss Jeremiah 17, 9? Your heart's deceitful. So is mine. We're humans. We're stubborn. But do you know what he meant by that in Jeremiah 17, 9? He meant that sometimes our hearts lie to us. Almost every time we want to do something that feels good. Short term, we intuitively know that it is not good for us for the long term. And so our hearts come up with reasons to do things that we want to do rather than the thing that's best for us for the long term. So 
Your heart lies to you. My heart, heart lies to me. So that's why the Bible is so important and we, we studying this and reading this and filtering, okay, my heart feels like this, Dean. Like, I really want to do this. But you know what? I don't really see that matching up with Scripture in this situation. So maybe I'm going to go pivot and make a course correction to do what God wants me to do. And then when you do that, you will fall into the path and you will fall into the will of God because just because you don't see exactly how it's going to work out doesn't mean that it won't work out. Come on, church. you got to trust and believe with everything that you have that God is sovereign and He knows more than you ever will about your path, your life, and your world. Whew, we have a church in here this morning. Mm. Yes. But the heart is deceitful above all things. So Solomon says, when you find yourself at a fork, fork in the road, and every decision is a fork in the road, when you find yourself there, don't trust your heart. Trust God and His Word. Don't lean on your own understanding. Lean on God. Don't acknowledge your motivations, your intentions, your ambitions. Acknowledge God's. If you do this, he will make your path straight. Jesus said something similar uh, to this in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Acknowledge God and his ways, and he will make your path straight. He'll direct you in the way that you should go. He will protect you when evil and trash just try to crowd in on you. Let us check it out again. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Now, I'm going to ask you a tough question, okay? Uh, has there ever been a time when you acknowledge God in all your ways? Many of us have trusted Him for salvation. Absolutely, we love that. But that's kind of like inviting God into your living room. When you have company over, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus, come on in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grab a seat in the recliner. We're going to put on the game. We're watching the cats. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Make yourself comfortable, okay? Uh, you know, we say, here, Lord, come into my life, but that's as far as you let him in. Have you invited him into your bedroom where all your private thoughts are? Have you invited him onto your computer or your phone or your tablet where all your access to the world is? Have you invited him into the kitchen of your heart where he can see the motivation and window to your soul? You know, when you have company over, typically you invite him to come in and hang out in the living room, but your real good friends, your close friends, you have them come on into the kitchen because that's where all the good stuff is. That's where that hamburger stew is going to be at and that's where those deep fried Oreos are going to be at. You're going to be uh, pulling up a bowl and, and drinking a Diet L80 and you're going to be loving life in fellowship and it's going to be amazing. Why not invite Jesus to that same place? Have you invited Jesus into your closet where all your secrets are? Let me share something with you, church. You are only as sick as your secrets. When light shines on the darkness, whoo, get ready. Because here he comes, baby. Here he comes to restore, redeem, and rejuvenate and refresh. Seek first the kingdom of God and he'll take care of the rest. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will steer your ship in the right direction. He's going to steer your car into the right path, your life into the right places, your plans and your priorities. This is the path. This is the way. Moving to a new area like Lexington uh, to get across town I get lost very easily. I get lost very easily anyway because I'm just not good with directions. So uh, there's probably about 17 different ways that you can get from uh, the Hamburg area, which I live in, to Gardenside Christian Church, or let's say you're trying to do something downtown. There's like a million side streets, zigzags, and all that, and I get totally lost uh, especially when I first moved here. And so um, 
it, it, it was pretty challenging. But thankfully, someone invented this magical device called GPS. And so now, all I do is just punch in where I want to go, and this little woman inside a box says, turn left in 100 yards. Turn left onto Lane Allen Road. Or turn right on Alexandria Drive. Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if it, getting on and staying on God's path was just that simple? Well, it almost is. See, the only trick to it is to override the happiness now bias in your brain, which really comes from the deceitfulness of our hearts. You override it with the perfect wisdom that God gives from His Word and His Spirit. I want to pose a question for you this week. We're going to ask this question. If you could strip away the self-deceiving reasons for your actions and be completely honest right now, what path are you on that you know you shouldn't be? But you chose it to be on that path because you wanted something other than to acknowledge God's ways? That's a pretty tough question, man. If, if, you're, if you're truly honest with yourself, that is some serious introspection and reflection. On one level, this is a question we never want to be asked by anyone because it reveals so much about us and our intentions. On another level, it's the question we've always wanted to ask because this is the area that we want and so desperately need the most help with. This is the question that breaks us out of isolation and pseudo-community and allows others to walk our lives with us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Of course, you can lie uh, when you answer this question or discuss this maybe in a small group of friends or at a Bible study that we're going to be offering in our small groups and grow, uh, gather and grow classes. You can find an excuse to skip this opportunity for self-reflection this week, but I think it's such a good question here because what it's really saying is, where is it that you haven't been trusting God with all your heart? Remember, this morning we're talking about your heart matters. Where is that? At least before now, you hadn't acknowledged God in all your ways. And then the question that follows is, is, is there a way we can help you with that? I don't want to just ask a question and not pose a solution to you. How can we help with that? And so those are the type of things that, that we need to be asking ourselves on a regular basis. So Solomon continues his thought on this about getting on God's path. He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Woo! Do not be wise in your own eyes. After telling us the key to a straight path, the path that you want to take, the path that will always get you from where you are to exactly where you want to be, Solomon suggests three action steps to take in order to trust God fully and acknowledge Him in everything. And the first one is this. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think, I don't need to consult God on this. After all, I am an expert at it, and I've taken classes in it. I've taken online courses on it, so I pretty much know what I'm doing. So God, you just you sit back and you put that on cruise control, because I got it. Whew, that's a mistake. Every decision, every fork in the road is a new fork. Wherever you are today, you've never been there before. So resist the temptation to think that you know it all. That's when you get into trouble. Consult God in all your ways with all your forks in the road. The second action item is this. Honor God's provisions for you. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. After all, it came from Him. And it all came from Him. If you want to direct your past, first let Him direct your wallet. For most of us, our wallets are somehow connected to our hearts, aren't they? I mean, that's, 
That's, I know it's maybe tough to hear, and I'm right here with you, because that, that's a pretty serious thing, right? But it's also true. And I would be doing you a disservice by not sharing God's truth from you, however uncomfortable or comfortable it may be. Someone may say, you're you're talking about matters of the heart? Oh, that's a lovey-dovey, easy softball sermon. And you could just, boom, share that truth. We're going to hit it hard today because that's what God wants from us. He wants us to acknowledge Him in all our ways. And sometimes that's our wallets. God says, hey, if you want my input, trust me with your output. I gave it all to you anyway. If you trust me, just give. And you know it's true, and you've heard this said before like a bajillion times, but that doesn't make it any less true. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. I heard someone really wise say that. You know, I love watching people in their 20s go from what they think is poor to being really rich. So here's how it works. They say to themselves, look, there is a concert coming up, but I can barely afford it. Should I go or not go? After all, this opportunity may only come once in a lifetime, and I have to see Beyonce. I have to see Taylor Swift. I have to see the Biebs, Justin Bieber. I have to see that, or whoever it may be. And so they feel poor, but they got to find that money, and they got to go. They got to go. Then a few years later, they get married and have a child. That baby needs diapers and formula and blankets and new shoes and more things than a newly minted mom and dad ever dreamed of. Now when all the Beyonce's and Lucy Lou's get on the floor and start performing and have a concert, uh, they say, are you kidding? Of course I can't go on that concert. I can't see that i got to provide for my family. i got to take care of my child. And suddenly, their love for a person has changed all their priorities. <laughs> they love that baby so much, they don't even think of it as given. It's just part of who they are now. So you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And something mysterious happens when you give. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 21. Which seems kind of backwards. Because if you love, you'll give. But God knows that if you give, you'll love. So he says, if you want my direction for your life, if you want me to guide you, honor me with the first fruits of all your crops. The first of everything you earn for whatever kind of work you do. Then I'll be able to fill your barns to overflowing. Now, I'm not going to tell you about this and encourage you to do this without doing this myself. Uh, tithing is just part of who we are. It's not a matter of if, it's, it's when. All the time, like every week. Yes. Uh, the Bible says that if you will tithe, God will pour out His blessings on you. That's not always financial but often it is. I don't know how many times uh, we've had to make a decision. Do you do this or do that? You prioritize, right? You, you put uh, effort and influence into what's important to you. And so, so we would make a decision to, to uh, support this ministry or do something like that. And then just somewhere, just randomly, <laughs> just money shows up out of nowhere out of nowhere and I say no it's not nowhere it's from up there it's from God because he's in control of everything but so 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 we get focused on this path and we get focused on this narrow uh tunnel vision here and, and sometimes we have a hard time following the big picture the whole picture the kingdom picture and we get so focused on our narrow fiefdom of what we want to do and what we really love to do but we forget the big picture that god is in control man and if we trust him we're going to give everything to him we're going to give everything to Him. The latest and greatest things of this world are really cool and really shiny, but it is also extremely apparent that they are also very fleeting and very temporary. And the wants and desires of today are quickly changed like a teenager changing outfits. 
to go out on a date or the latest version of the iPhone changes pretty rapidly, doesn't it? So many times we have, uh, we have just uh, been focused on just doing what God wants us to do, just going on the path. Because every single time we trust God, He shows He is worthy of trust. He always provides. Solomon says, if you're going to acknowledge God in all your ways, one of them is your financial ways. Now the third thing I want to share with you is, as we wrap up here is, don't blame God for, of your pain. Don't blame God for your pain. Verse 11 says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not rescind his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Sometimes, and I know this is shocking, but sometimes you caused what is happening to you. I know it's true for me. I've made a whole bunch of mistakes. But I believe that God has grace and that God is bigger than I thought he ever was. So I too am a dog rescued from the pound. And so that I'm rescued, then I'm going to be grateful with everything I got. And so... uh, We can be the cause of our own problems. And sometimes God knows that you need some correction, and we need correction, which He provides like every loving father does. And, you know, I've heard someone say that if you play stupid games, you'll win stupid prizes. I've also heard many people say, why did God let this happen to me? Usually... They're in too much pain to hear the truth at the moment. But the truth is, in most cases, God didn't let that happen to them. God didn't want it to happen to them. God tried to prevent it from happening to them. He even tried to warn them multiple times. But surprise, surprise, we can be stubborn as a mule or stubborn as a merit. And surprise, we didn't listen. So this is where we ended up. On the other hand, there are some things that are completely out of our control, like, I don't know, a global pandemic. But one of the things that I believe that God has done through this is show us what our true priorities are and then what they need to be to be brought back on the path. So at first, if you can remember, everybody's priority was toilet paper and hand sanitizer and panic because everyone was freaking out. And so then, after being in isolation and doing social distancing for so long, we got a new appreciation for human connectivity and real relationships, like gathering in person to have a worship service and honor God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and everything. So we understood that gathering together in person is essential for growth. It's essential for our soul. But before the pandemic, you might have thought, you know, we're doing really good. We're doing really well, but we're going to ignore some important priorities, but uh, I think we'll be okay. But now with this shift of how things have transpired over the past year and a half, two years now, uh, I'm much more focused on my wife and children. I'm working hard to find work, but this time off, this break, it has been so good for redirecting my values to where they should have been the whole time before this pandemic thing began. Maybe some of you are thinking that. The Lord disciplines those He loves like a father with a son that He delights in. So the three things that Solomon shares is don't be wise in your own eyes. Honor God's provision for you. And don't blame God for your pain. Those are Solomon's suggestions. Let me just finally wrap up with some that I would like to share with you. And that is this. Come back next week. Come back next week. And in order to keep gaining wisdom and understanding, come back and study God's Word with us. We'll talk about choosing your path. And Rick's going to share an awesome message that hits on an even deeper level than we are now in discovering this truth. The second thing is this. Read from the book of Proverbs. There's 31 days this month. 31 chapters. 31 Proverbs. 
I don't know, sounds like a good idea. I, I think it would be awesome, right? Keep an apple a day and a proverb a day. We'll keep all the craziness away. Or at least it won't, it won't keep the crazy away, but at least it'll give you a solution to deal with it with contentment in your soul that you have a connection to Jesus Christ and the wisdom of God at your hands. And the third thing is this, is sign up for a GCC group, whether it's a gather and grow class that we're going to be offering or a, a small group, a small class setting, uh, sign up for that. Uh, so you can ask those questions about, what am I really doing? Uh, where are my motivations? You know, our hearts can be misconstrued and misunderstood. We can be self-preserving, self-serving, and stubborn like a mule or a merit. But if we truly are honest about ourselves and with God, look, most of the time we don't want the straight path. We just want what we want. That's, that's human nature. But if some of those paths cross of what God wants and what we want, that's cool. But that's not being sought intentionally. That's the simple way of looking at things. And if you live simple, you're going to pay the penalty being prudent works out a lot better in the long run. Look for the fork in the road and invite God not only into your living room, but into our kitchens, in our closets, our bedrooms, our bathrooms, and our basements. Let Him have it all and let Him guide your steps so that we can be on this path and be at the center of God's will together. Let's not be mules. Let's not be merits. Let's just be thankful that we are sons and daughters of the God of the Most High, that we are children of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for our time together. We love you so much, and we want to honor you and acknowledge you in all of our ways, uh, relationally, spiritually, financially, everything, everything that we have to offer, we want to give to you, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone that wants to acknowledge you this morning uh, uh, by coming up here and, and, and uh, making their heart new uh, through repenting and being baptized, I pray that you would give that person the boldness and the courage to come forward uh, as, as we come to this time of invitation, Lord. We love you and we thank you so much. Lord, thank you for your word and giving us the wisdom to make the right choice and to follow you on the path. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing at this time of invitation? If you have any need, please come forward. If you uh, need to, to renew your heart, renew your mind, acknowledging God here together with this body of believers, we want to team up with you this morning. So won't you come as we stand and sing at this time of invitation? This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my day.
sure I get this right. This is uh, Jim and Susan Geisler. Did I say it right? Did I? Good, good. Well, I've been Bernadette, Burnett, and that, yeah, through my whole life. Uh, uh, and uh, Jim and Susan have been attending for a while now uh, and shared with me, I think it was last week or week before last, that uh, uh, after about 19 years of, uh, of really longing for a family uh, to be a part of, uh, they come as immersed believers in Christ and want to make Gardenside their, their church home. So Jim and Susan, we welcome you. We want to be the, the family that loves you as brothers and sisters. We want to be uh, the body that helps you heal and also uh, uh, the, the bride of Christ that longs uh, for Jesus' return. So you made this confession a while ago, but we're going to share it together. And so I'm going to ask you to repeat after me that confession you made many years ago. I believe, I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the Living God. He's the Son of the Living God. He's my Savior. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. Father God, thank you so much for this family. Thank you, Father God, for how you providentially work and bring us together. And thank you for Jim and Susan. Thank you that they're here today. And we thank you for this communion that we're going to share together in just a moment, that which bonds us together. Uh, just thank you for the Geislers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go sit down, Jim. So, how do you choose the path for eternity? And how important are the first few steps that you make on it? I'll share with you in Christianity the path that God has in mind for us always leads us to the cross. And at the cross, we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision whether we're going to surrender our life to Christ. To die, to be buried in Christ and rise and then leave the cross. Walking in newness of life. To leave the cross a resurrected, born again, Holy Spirit filled follower of Jesus. Now, when the early Christians did this, we read in God's Word that Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says that on the first day of the week, on the first day of the week, we committed ourselves to the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week, you think about that for the Jewish community, that was a radical change, wasn't it? Because Saturday, the Sabbath, was the day that they normally would meet together. So why are they meeting on Sunday now? It's because of the day of the resurrection. Things have shifted. On the day of the resurrection, the church is now getting together for their first steps on the path. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves. We vote about a lot of things in this world, don't we? If the majority agree on it, we follow it. We are a constitutional republic, but we like majority vote, don't we? How about if you devote? How about if you take all the majority opinion away but you make a commitment to something because it is the most important first steps on the path. That's what the early church did. They devoted themselves to four core ingredients to their journey. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the Word of God. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Church came before everything else. They devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and they devoted themselves to prayer. So what are your priorities? What are the things that you have committed and there's not a vote about it. You have committed yourselves, you have devoted yourselves to staying on this path. 
I would share with you that the early Christians said, we're going to rally around God's word, the apostles' doctrine. We're going to gather around the breaking of bread to the fellowship and prayer. Jesus instituted this supper that we're going to share together today. He took a cup and when he had given thanks, Matthew 26, 27 says, he gave it to them and he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Will you drink a cup with me? He took the bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Father God, we remember that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so as we have partaken of this cup, tasting that fruit of the vine, we recall your blood shed in a new covenant to cover our sins and make them as white as snow. And Lord God, as we have taken of this unleavened bread, as it was broken, we remember that you are pierced for our forgiveness, wounded, Father God, for our iniquities. Thank you that your body, your perfect, sinless body, housed all our sins and died to pay the price that our sins deserved, death. Oh, but Father God, we remember that you are a resurrected Savior, that you conquered the penalty. And Father, because you are our Lord and because you are our Savior, we also have conquered that penalty of death. We long for your return. We end this prayer with the prayer of John the Beloved. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and Lean not on your own understanding. We talked about that this morning. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. When it comes to our giving, I think that's a challenge uh, because we want what we want, and we're stubborn mules and merits sometimes. But when we set aside the bias and focus on the big picture and the kingdom of God, you'll see that God does more with that little bit that we give uh, than we could ever ask or imagine or dream. And I'll, I'll share with you that uh, my family, we really, we really have put it to the test. Uh, uh, I remember uh, my wife and I were newly married. Uh, we recently went back to uh, the, the city where, where we first met in Vandalia, Illinois and a small rural community and and we we went there uh, to honor and, and do a memorial service for uh, one of the former elders there at the church we served at and uh, I remember uh, it was uh, around our, our wedding day uh, or after that we got gift cards and stuff very kind gestures you know when you get married people are pretty cool to you sometimes and so uh, I remember uh, my wife uh, took some of that, the gift cards to like Walmart and stuff. She went to the store and uh, she was going to go get some dinner. And uh, she came back and she didn't have nearly what we talked about. And I was like, hey, I love you, but where's dinner? 
she told me this. She said, uh, there was a, a mother, a single mother, and a child right next to her in the freezer section. And they were talking about different things. And the little, little child put in, uh, put in something in the cart. She says, no, no, we can't afford that. We can't do that. Uh, pick something else. And then God just put on my wife's heart to, to give some of that gift card to them. And she didn't think about it so much as the, uh, about us or anything. She could care less, but she cared about those people and being on the path and, and being concerned with the whole kingdom, not just our fiefdom. And uh, as she walked away, I will never forget this. She heard the mom say to the daughter, at least we can have meat tonight. It's amazing what God can do with what little we give. It's amazing. So I want to encourage you uh, to give. To give uh, for God's kingdom to be increased uh, here at Gardenside, but also in our neighborhood, in our state, in our country, in the world, spreading the good news that Jesus saves. And so we have several ways you can do that. We have mailboxes, uh, black mailboxes on the, the walls as you go out. Uh, you can put your tithe and offering there. Uh, or uh, you can go online and do easy tithe. You can do it uh, from your phone or computer and just click on giving and you can do it that way. Or you can send a physical offering to uh, 940 Holly Springs Drive, Lexington, Kentucky. 40504 and our amazing treasure Tim which just had a birthday shout out to Tim uh, amazing treasure Tim will take care of all those funds uh, and, and put them in the appropriate places man I hope you have a blessed day a blessed week and let's choose God and acknowledge him in all our ways when those forks come into the road Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for our time together that we can learn more about you and your will for our lives, that if we would acknowledge you and put you first in, in everything that we do, that we would be in the center of your heart, the center of your will. Lord, help us to do that today and this week and the rest of our lives. We trust you, we love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. We'll see you next time.